ignore or, or put off your experience, I think you minimize your existence when you do that. Yeah. Because there is something, you, there's something to be found in that experience. Whether it's metaphysical, God, or nothing, it will add to your life. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what a lot of people miss. When you go to the paranormal side, uh, the rules are very obscure. Mm-hmm. We don't know what the rules are. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I kind of go a little bit more with the metaphysical side. And when we're doing an investigation, I don't look for the evidence of the ghost. I look for what's missing. Everybody and welcome to the Paranormal Portal. I'm your host, Brent Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got an epic show ahead, but just remember, if any of you have experiences you'd like to share, I'd love to hear from you. You can either email me at paranormalportalradio at gmail.com or head over to paranormalportal.net. Scroll down and find the button that says interview me, and that'll allow you to look at a calendar of possible times and dates and uh, find a date that works for you. Love to hear your stories, so definitely get in touch with me. Ladies and gentlemen, today we got a special show again. Uh, This has been an an epic time here in Vernal, Utah. We're meeting and networking with some incredible people, and today is no exception. We are joined by Greg Lawson, who is the paranormal detective himself. I am, yeah. Uh, Dave Schrader said I was the paranormal detective, so it's just God go with, true. yeah, you just go with Dave, what Dave Schrader says. Whatever Dave says goes. Yeah. People are like, oh, you're the paranormal detective. Yeah, exactly. Not a. <laughs> I am the. The paranormal, the paranormal detective. So, nice. so you are author of four books? Uh, five books on five the books. paranormal and then another, uh, I guess, another seven on other stuff. Okay. Gotcha. So, you know, just dealing with the paranormal, of course, I guess it's it's where we live you know i've been doing the doing a paranormal podcast but how did this start for you where did where did this journey begin for you uh 1969 i was five on the gas tank of my brother's triumph bonneville 650 a lot uh he would uh take me he was su- he was 17 at the time <clears throat> he was to, to what 12 years older mm-hmm. And he would, uh, he'd go, hey, let's go for a motorcycle ride. And he'd take me and set me on the gas tank because my feet, I mean, I'm five years old. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, no helmet, you know, high, I'm going down the highway. Uh, and we went and he would do ur- urban exploration. He'd look for abandoned houses, abandoned buildings. We would go and walk around and look at stuff. And he w- would always take me to two cemeteries. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we would go to a cemetery, we would, you know, he'd, go park and we'd get off and we'd walk around. He would always look for the youngest uh, person sure. buried in the cemetery. Oh, you know? oh goodness. Yeah. And he would find somebody and go, oh, yeah, you know, this is little Jimmy Burt or whatever. Sure. He was five. He was younger than you are. Oh. And then he would commence to tell the story and say, yeah, well, you know Jimmy. And he would go into the long story. It's a horrific, some horror, horrible story of him being dismembered and going through a wood chipper. Oh, good oh, yeah. gracious. And uh, and just scare the heck out of me, right? Yeah. And then we'd go over to the motorcycle and he'd go, "What's that?" I'm oh, well, I'm trying to get on the motorcycle. I'm not I'm not, I'm not too small. I remember this vividly. It's, yeah, it's like tattoo. And then me. he'd put me on the gas tank, you know, and he'd he'd uh, start kicking the motorcycle. Right. And he wouldn't turn the on switch on. He'd have the key on, but he wouldn't turn the on switch on. So, <laughs> what is it? I think it's coming to get us. And I'm like, oh, go, go. <laughs> that was horrible. Oh. So I, in turn, you know, four or five years later. I started doing that to my friends in elementary school, you know. And sure, it's take perpetuating it. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So uh, it's that, uh, that you know, um, very much incestuous, you know, <laughs> torture, right, that that you do. That's right. And, uh, and so with that, you know, I'm, I, I was the weird kid in junior high and high school. Um, most of them, I mean, you know, motorcycles, rock and roll, and urban exploration, riding and, and going and looking at graveyards and stuff. So I, that's just what I did. Yeah. And I was always the, the first book I think I read, um, I was in junior high 
Uh, and I just, I didn't want to read. I, I wasn't that kid that, that read, but there was a book for In Search of Atlantis. Right. Right. I was like, oh, what's this? You know, and I read that and that was fascinating. To was me. that Charles Berlitz? I don't remember who wrote that. Yeah, um, be, but anyway, but it was uh, it was a fascinating book. I've actually looked for it, like on eBay and stuff, see if I could find it. And I can't can't ever find it. But I don't remember if that's exactly the, the title. Okay. Um, but I think I would recognize the cover. I remember the cover, and I would look at in eBay, and I can't find it. Sure. Uh, but so I I end up going into the army, uh, and when I went into the army, I was with the second airborne division, and so we were a rapid deployment unit. So we were in a lot of different places mm -hmm. and back then um, there was these places called libraries and they had these things called books in there <laughs> and i wasn't a big avid reader but i knew the value of you know things that are written in books yeah and i would go and i'd do some research so uh with, at, at, when i was at the 82nd uh i, I was also with a um uh, second of 508, and I was uh, uh, also up in Alaska. I was a cold weather indoctrination instructor up in Alaska. Wow. And so between that and being deployed to Central America, I was in Guatemala, El Salvador, San Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras. Wow. Um, and then then I was deployed over the Middle East. I was with multinational force observers uh, in the Sinai Desert uh, between Israel, I mean, Israel and Egypt. So I was all over Egypt. Uh, I was all over the, the South uh, Sinai Desert, Red Sea. Uh, I got a couple of deployments to Chad and Sudan out of that also. We were, we were very active back then yeah. in, the, uh, in the Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, sure. uh, times. Right. And um, so all of these places, wherever we would go, I would always go, okay, we're, we're deploying to Egypt. What's the cool stuff? What do I have to know about Egypt? Right. Okay. Um, you know, I, while I was there, do a little bit of research in Israel, you know, go to the cool places there. So that's kind of what I did. And it was just a natural thing to me. And I'm, I've done that and I'm going to law enforcement, unfortunately. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily re regret it, but, sure. uh, because I never thought about me being a cop ever. Right. It just happened. Sure. Uh, and trust me, you want me to show up at your scene. You don't yeah. want Tackleberry to show up in here. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. I get it. And, and so um, in that, uh, I, I became a mental health investigator and a suicide mediator, a hostage negotiator, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And through that, I've interviewed hundreds of abductees for aliens, uh, all kinds of stuff. Because I was a mental health officer, and, and a lot of uh, people who are suffering from mental illness have diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder or whatever they're having delusions hallucinations and that sort of stuff we get called there and i would talk to these people about this and that's one of those things about uh when you're qualifying a, a paranormal witness it's like you know well why are they why are they wanting to tell you this what's their motivation sure uh what are they trying to get out of it are they actually trying to to get help what, what's the deal and then you qualify them how are your eyes what's your mental condition what kind of uh, uh, medication you're on and all that sort of stuff so um i i know very few people in the paranormal world that have done that yeah oh yeah i mean I agree. this is involving law enforcement and we're investigating you know an alien abduction mm -hmm. uh never could uh, nail down that they were actually abducted, but just because they're quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, crazy, yeah. doesn't mean it didn't happen to them. Right. Right. right? Yeah. So in, in doing that, <clears throat> I just kind of went on doing my, my own freaky kind of paranormal thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I ended up going back in, I went back in the military, went in the Navy for four years. I was deployed all over the Asia and, and South Pacific. Uh, Middle East, and then uh, and did the same thing, you know. Other than getting really drunk, because it is absolutely true, right? <laughs> Sailors have more fun. <laughs> absolutely true. You okay. got so much money when you pull into port, you just <laughs> blow it in four days, man. You, bam. Sure. Um, and so you know, I got to got to do a lot of a lot of that stuff. And then when, when I get back, and I'm I'm kind of back in law enforcement doing my thing. And these TV shows start popping up. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, because the only, the only TV show I had was uh, In Search Of mm -hmm. when I was a kid and, and maybe uh, Unsolved Mysteries. But th those, the, those the, the Unsolved Mysteries and In Search Of was one. Yeah, Leonard Nimoy. Me yeah. too, yeah. yeah. 
And uh, and so all of a sudden these these shows start popping up. Um, and some other stuff was going on. I had written a couple of books. I'd written a couple of novels prior to that. And I wrote a book called, uh, zombie advocacy. Mm -hmm. And it's a satirical book about what would lawyers do if we had a bunch of zombies running out? Right. <laughs> they would go out there and fight for their rights and they would try to seize their property and they would, you know, try to make sure that we didn't shoot them in the head and all that stuff. <laughs> And uh, as you can imagine, zombie advocacy book doesn't sell a lot of copies because everybody <laughs> wants to shoot them in the head. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, oh, this sucks. I did a lot of work. I was very proud of that book. It's a great one. Oh. Um, so, you know, fuck. all right, so there's that. Uh, a couple of years later, maybe a year and a half, two years later, I get an email uh, from a group in New Orleans saying, hey, are you? did you write the zombie book? I'm like, yes, I did. Do you ever do conferences and, and talk about it? Of course I do. Yeah, I <laughs> Uh, I hadn't at that point, but right. yeah, they don't even do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. And so they, they flew Lynn and I, Lynn's my, my behavior modification unit. Uh, and, uh, and she and I went out to New Orleans and, uh, um, we did this little event and, uh, I showed up and it was voodoo practitioners. Oh, <laughs> they, they, they thought I was like zombie advocate. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I showed up and I'm like, you guys understand this is satirical, right? So I ended up being their comedy relief. We had a great time. Oh, nice. Oh, very good. Had a great time. Uh, and out of that, somebody was in that audience uh, and went to another conference and said, hey, you need to get Greg Laws to come in and do this. Nice. So I went to a couple of those. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, man, you guys are doing this ghost hunting all wrong, dude. What are y'all doing? You know? Right. And, uh, and it, not necessarily wrong, just sure. it's like, if you want me to take you seriously about what you're doing, you might want to get a little bit of training. You might want to read s some stuff on how to interview. My, my, by the way, this setup right here and everything, I feel like I'm getting cross-examined. Oh, sorry. know that. Wow, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you sit down, you know, it's, uh, all right, today is this day, this time. <laughs> We're here with suspect Greg Morrison. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, you're doing a really good job. You're, like, pushing me in the corner. <laughs> So you know, and and, I, and so I I thought, well maybe uh, I ha maybe I have some worth. I have some experience uh, that is a TV spotlight, right? And it's like this is how you would do an investigation. This is how you would do research. Mm -hmm. Research today is typically Google. You know what's scary and vernal. Yeah, ten things pop up. <laughs> you go, oh, this lady. You know, there's a there's a woman in blue that flies above the the cliffs. Um. Let's go look at that. So you go out to the cliffs and you sit out there and you do that. That's that's when people say research. That's typically the kind of research that's uh, where to go. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, I might work on two things a year, uh, and I will have my you know tin foil hat on, and I'll have stacks of papers of, of as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And I really try very hard to go to county records and go to the old map systems and and. Uh, um, wherever they're recording right. the stuff that really happened for the government, right. uh, and then research a lot of the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So I decided to write the book. Uh, it was called uh, uh, "Detecting Paranormal," uh, and I'm sitting at my table in Michigan, and Rosemary Allen Guiley walks up with my book, and she goes, "Hey, can you sign your book, Greg?" And I'm like, "For the, those of you who don't know who Rosemary Allen Guiley is, she is the Pope S of the paranormal." Um, I don't think there's a, another woman with a higher credential than right. than what she was, uh, and and I said, yeah, yeah. Where'd you get this? I could have given you a book. She has never give away your books. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> she wrote like seventy two books or something oh, like that. Yeah. Yeah, she wrote a lot. Of it. Hmm. So I signed it. She goes, you under contract? I said, no. She goes, I want to do a book. Wow. I'm like, all right. So that was born into how to become a paranormal detective. Wow. She took a red pen and bled all over detecting paranormal. What does this mean? This makes no sense. No, you're wrong about this. Wow. You know, it was it was great. She was a great mentor. Oh, right. Um, so we did that. <clears throat> um, and then right after we got through with that, she says, uh, you need to write a book about your stuff. And I'm like, nobody wants to hear that. I'm this is, you know, I'm more metaphysical guy than I am ghost hunting guy. She goes, no, write me a couple of stories, some to me. So I did. And she goes, we're going to write a book. Oh, no. So we get to chapter 10 and she dies. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. So, and so uh, the publisher wanted to continue going. I was like, no, contract says I'm done with her. This is it. This is our book. That's all. Um, so that's that kind of got me more. I mean, you know, when you have Rosemary Ellen Guiley right. 
going to the end going, okay, people need to know what you're saying, but we're going to say it the right way. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> She's correct. You know? Correcting as she goes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and because there, there is a, a true bridge, you know, people talk about, um, using the scientific method. I'm like, I'm, and you're using, you know, uh, evidence based research and everything. It's like, how do you use normal means to collect paranormal evidence? I'm confused about it. right. How do you use scientific method in something that is unrepeatable? It's not, and and you're you're not using just one instrument. You're using a human being that is interpreting what happened to them in their social construct and their cultural construct. Mm, right. You know, it's. Every the the book that I just did came out last last uh, week. Messages from Mahnan. That's what that's about. It's how are we interpreting the evidence? Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, you, you look at the Mahnan story. There's not much to that story, right? When you look at it bare bones, and that's what I kind of do. I boil everything down. Mm -hmm. um, you got some couples in a car. You got a few people that see the thing in the trees and on top of a building. Mm -hmm. um, you got the Silver Bridge collapse. Um, there's a couple of other things that hurt. I mean, anomalous, really. And then everybody comes to consensus. Of, oh, he was trying to tell us that the Silver Bridge was going to collapse. Yeah. Where the hell did that come from? Right. Right. That's their interpretation of what, what it is now. And it's very easy after the fact. Right. It's, yeah. It's, oh, sure. So uh, when I decided to do this book, it's very much about uh, how do we individually... Um, interpret the experience that we have and not minimize our experience as human beings right. by going what most Christians would say. Mm. I was raised Catholic and a recovering Catholic. Thank you. <laughs> and But what most Christians would say, there's no such thing as ghosts, don't pay it, all that doesn't matter, or it's a demon yeah, right. Right, right away or whatever. Um, but when you when you ignore or, or put off your experience i think you minimize your existence when you do that yeah because there is something you there's something to be found in that experience whether it's metaphysical god or nothing it will add to your life right mm -hmm. and i think that's what a lot of people miss so by by recognizing those things uh and assigning meaning in your life to it can't see how that can be a bad thing right and and i mean shamans and everything have been doing that forever right when since the first guy looked up in the air and went eh, yeah. who am i what's happening what are those things yeah. oh that that owl boy he looks wise to me. you know like, <laughs> uh, that 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 wolf uh, oh the snake he's bad yeah. you know and just assigning meanings to all these things it's something that we do. It's, it's it's referred to as perennialism. Where is the first thing that this thought was born from? Mm -hmm. uh, and and it was a long time ago. We still hold on to that stuff. So so that's that's kind of where I've gone with with all my training experience and and just wherever this was born out of. I think it's part of the human condition, though, right? To or to, uh, well, it's all subjective. Everything is subjective that people are experiencing, especially in the paranormal, because usually people experience it on their own. It has to go through your filters. It comes out through your interpretation, and three people may have the same experience, but explain it completely different. So I think that's always the challenge in all of this. So it's neat that uh, it, what you're bringing to the table is a more uh, objective approach. And and trying to eliminate the subjective, I think that's right. Uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people say, "Oh, I'd like to have you, you know, come and join our team and do this." So, what is it that you, you're ghost hunter, right? I'm like, no, I'm not a ghost hunter. I'm I am uh, I'm a professional investigator, mm -hmm. and whether I'm investigating an insurance fraud case or a you know a multiple murder, there is a standard procedure that you do in your investigation. So, if I'm going to investigate Bigfoot, if I'm going to investigate a spirit that was seen in a house. I'm going to, you know, there's, there's certain parameters on it. Uh, a lot of times, like 
um, let's say a woman was killed in a house mm -hmm. uh, at this particular date, particular time, and then people, you know, 40 years later, they're like, oh, this house is haunted, and they just randomly show up, run around in the dark. Uh, and that's one of the things about, uh, about paranormal is it's the only uh, investigative method where less light is better. You know, it's like less, uh, you know, less scientist and less science is better. Sure. Uh, and, but I can, exp I can explain that also. Please. W well, so if, if there are ghosts, if there's the other side, mm -hmm. or if there's another dimension that we go to, whatever that other thing is, there's a veil between us and them. We can't see them. Right. Um, but every once in a while we do, or people do. And in that, um, maybe it takes a lot of energy for them to make that effort to do something. So if it was really easy, they'd be knocking over our glasses and, you know, writing, hey, I'm right in front of you, you know, something. <laughs> they would do something like that. And that, that doesn't necessarily happen in a good environment where people kept collected on evidence. They always have anecdotal, yeah. you know, oh, this happened to me or the movies, right? But if it's, if it's really hard to do that, Maybe uh, the energy it takes to do that is astronomical. We can't, we, it's just really hard to do. Right. So if you dim the lights, um, I, I, like in this room, if I had a very, very low light bulb with a projector right here, like you see in a lot of terror presentations and stuff, you can barely see the thing on right. the wall. Right. You dim the lights, it looks fine. So the idea, I think, behind a lot of people, I don't know whether they've really thought about it or not, as far as going into the dark and looking for these things, that could be a, a logical uh, explanation on how to get to that, that point and saying, no, we need to do this in the dark because maybe they can only get one watt oh, to come through. Right. Good point. And, yeah. like, like dim orbs or some Right. Or maybe that's all yeah. it is. Wow, that's a great uh, point. Yeah, and and so because I, I have people argue with me all the time, especially especially cynics, and and I go to the cynic side, and you get the gullible side, cynic side, and the, the the skeptic floats around in the middle based on training experience and evidence, right? Right, sure. And so I have a lot of people like, well, you run around in the dark and everything, and it's just stupid, you know. If you want to find something, you got to have lots of lights, you got to have these <laughs> gadgets, you have to have this and that. I'm like, well. Oh, the gadgets really telling us that there's a ghost there, right? You know, and, uh, I use the uh, an EMF detector to to check the ballast, check check what's going on in the walls and stuff, sure. and I'll eliminate all the naturally occurring stuff. And when I do that, and what I'm talking about when I say that, like let's say we're in Texas, let's say it's in the summertime, uh, I'm going to shut the whole house down except for the AC and the refrigerator, right? And then I'm going to isolate, figure out where the uh, EMF is coming from, how far it's out there that it's going to disturb my equipment, and I'll put my equipment away from it. Uh, right. That way, that it's not going to right. affect it. And uh, I do these experiments a, a lot of times when I'm doing these events with uh, like uh, Strange Escapes with Amy Bruni or with uh, um, uh, Brad Blair up in Michigan or or Kling Brothers or whoever. Um, we have people coming in and we're doing like ghost hunts or whatever. I will tell you, I have a really, I have a really expensive EMF <laughs> detector. Uh, and it's it's odd because uh, my little K two meter that I the, the knockoff sure I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to say it's a knockoff <laughs> um, it was like nineteen bucks or something it hits on everything it's amazing I don't I mean it, it's really good uh, and I will sit those two things side by side just down on the floor sure uh, wherever I am and the people that are paying to do the ghost hunt will come through mm. and I'm always watching. Because I'm um, identifying the people that still have their phones on. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Can Can you come over here? You know. All right. You know. Talk to me about this. Ooh, look. Everybody's like, oh, look. There's that. something here. I'm like, uh huh. Everybody, everybody pull out your phone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Turn them off. <laughs> Damn it, man. Yeah. <laughs> and and airplane mode doesn't always work. I don't right. know what the deal is with that, but mm. um, even even when you throw it in airplane mode, uh, my my equipment will go off. Yeah. Thing. I don't know what's going on. Especially with Androids, not so much with uh, the uh, iPhones. Android phones will leak that, and I don't know what it's doing. Oh. It's probably some app that they've put on there that will get around. Right, or I don't, I don't. Know. Maybe do something that needs a location identification, sub it GPS, maybe or something. Right, mm. and so I'll, I'll ask them to shut them completely off. Sure. Um, so I don't know where we were going with that. No, no. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me because I think, I think. 
oftentimes people take umbrage with the fact, oh, they call it a pseudoscience. And it's like, well, the, the methodologies that are using, that we're using to look for the paranormal really is pseudoscience. Hmm? Because we don't know anything really about what's going on. So we're taking all these borrowed technologies and trying to apply them to this incredible phenomena and look for, you know, any kind of solid indications. So, um, but that is also the liability of it, right? Sure. Yeah. Cause, cause you, you don't even know what you're getting at that point. Right. That That's the thing is, is, um, I, I am, I'm a little bit more on the metaphysical side, I think, okay. than the scientific side, even though, and I can draw the line uh, as far as if I'm going to the grand jury with a criminal report with evidence and all that stuff, I'm very clear about what my rules are. Right. When you go to the, when you go to the paranormal side, um, the rules are very obscure. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the rules are. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I kind of go a little bit more with the metaphysical side. And when we're doing an investigation, I don't look for the evidence of the ghost. I look for what's missing. Mm -hmm. It's that anomalous thing that should be there that is not, that doesn't make sense. Um, and so I was at uh, Haunted Hill House in Mineral Wells, Texas. Uh, and throughout a six hour period, this door kept opening every time I would leave the room. Mm -hmm. It would just open. And I'm a grown man. I know how to open a door. Right? <laughs> I know how to close the door. Okay. I know how after the door bothers me, I take out my ruler and I look at all the pieces of the door, look at the penetration <clears throat> of the bowl, look at the thing. I take my EMF, make sure there's no trick little flip switch or something on it or whatever. Nothing. I walk out, door opens. Walk back in, door's wide open when I go back. In. I had to have a small. It's like what you know, it's it's this thing that I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um and so that that's the things that, that kind of uh um intrigue me more is when we have stuff that's not there that that, that should be. That's really fascinating. I like that approach because I think it's it, you, I think a lot of people in this go into it with a real confirmation bias, right? They're not really being objective. They're looking for ghosts. And so when they get these triggers, it's like, there's a ghost. Right. You know, how many times have you seen videos of spirit orbs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that is... Well, and, and, so, and you look uh, prior to, what, 1990, maybe? Where were the orbs then? There were freaking no orbs running around. There were streaks and all kinds of stuff in film. Yes, and then you get you get digital, and all of a sudden you get all. Oh, we have this new technology that picks up these spirits that are floating around like bubbles, and they look there. We call them orbs. Okay, um, those are digital artifacts created by dust and a reflection of the light off the dust. Usually, yeah, you're right. Now you see the ones that that people have caught that uh, are actually luminous, and they're actually creating light on the things that they're going by that's not dust right uh, they're very rare i've mm -hmm. only seen a few and i can't prove whether they're the real thing or not because typically they're a copy of the video mm -hmm. so if they did any digital manipulation on the video and then made a copy then that digital manipulation yeah. possibly most likely would not come up and i don't have the equipment or the expertise to be able to to make that determination right does like uh um uh, Dave Schrader, he has that ability to do it. He's oh. really good with audio. Okay. Um, he's he's come up with several things where people say this audio of whatever, and then he'll take that audio and look at it, then play it backwards and do all kinds of stuff. And I say, like, yeah, that's not what that is. Sorry. Really? Okay. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but you know, because I I don't want to be known as debunker. I'm I'm I sure that's not my intent at all. But if it's not paranormal, sorry, dude, I'm not gonna sit there and go, oh wow, there's grandma and breaking the plates again, right? <laughs> and I'm not gonna do it. As this field moves forward and, and God only knows if we'll ever dial it into what this stuff is because even with even with emf i've often thought well uh, you know, since emf meters are triggered we often attribute well spirits have an electromagnetic field but 
what if it's something else? And it's not really an electromagnetic field in that we're traditionally, but whatever it is that they are reacts to the, the electromagnetic field. And I don't know what affects electromagnetic uh, fields at all. And I've tried to look into it, but I'm an idiot. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that because I think that maybe all of this is the breadcrumbs. And I, and I say this all the time on my show and it's, it's probably going to drive my listeners nuts that I'm saying it now, but I, I don't think this stuff is where things are going sideways. Whatever is being demonstrated, I think is incredibly profound. And it maybe is teaching us about the, the reality we live in because, you know, we often consider, well, this is very rigid and the rules are set, but then these weird things happen that, that don't follow the rules. Right. And so I, but I also wonder, I'm kind of piling a whole bunch of stuff out of here, so I'm sorry. No, you're good. What about things like AI and, and that kind of technology is emerging and how, how do you see that affecting this kind of field? So when you look at um, the switching over from analog video and film, mm -hmm. or even regular, just like VHS video, mm -hmm. um, and and you're looking at digital, uh, things got very precise and interesting. But you always have to remember, you have to think back. These are just ones and zeros in a computer program. Right. And it's only responding the way that the person, pro that program, the computer, tells it to respond. Good point, yeah. So it's not a real thing. Yeah. It's an interpretation of it. When you're, when you're doing analog audio, that's real audio going on to that magnetic. Mm -hmm. um, digital is a computer program. So you have uh, all these uh, apps and people say, yeah, I got this ghost app and it does this and does that. It only does what that guy that was sitting in his grandma's basement pushing ones and zeros told it to do. Yeah. And if it gets this certain thing, it's going to make it do this. Mm. Uh, that's not to minimize the work that Bill Chapel is doing. Right. I'm talking about mainly on, on apps. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, a, a lot of this stuff, we're just interpreting. And I always throw this in there because if you have the capacity to sit and be very quiet and think about this. We can't see each other. Mm -hmm. I don't see you. Yeah. I don't have a cam. I, I don't have a camera lens and the uh, visual spectrum of this energy is bouncing off of this table, going into my eye and, and showing up on a screen on the back of my head. Mm hmm. My eyeballs are just organs that collect that visual light and then they convert it into electronic and chemical responses, push it to the back of my brain, and there is a time lapse there. There's a slight tap time lapse. And my brain has to recreate what I think I have. Mm. When you do this and you sit lonely in your grandma's basement at night and you're, you're really looking at this knowing that you really can't see and that your brain is just constructing these things and we assume that this is what it looks like. Because we could, we could assume that this, is, this cup is clear because all of our, these organs, all of our organs work the same way as a human being. This could be black. But we just call it clear because that's the way we've chosen to decide uh, as a group we're going to call it. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, man, you do some meditation on thinking about this, it will freaking be really, <laughs> you get really weird about stuff because you're just like, you know, I wonder what this really is. Right. Right. Is that, yeah. And, and we, we're not the eyes are not our lens to our soul. There are just some organs that are converting some stuff and just makes you wonder, you know, I mean, I'm, am I completely in darkness here actually? But, right. And I say that because you have the electronic, you know, electromagnetic spectrum and we only see this little bitty part of it. Right. And you have all this other stuff that is bombarding us. And we've, if we want to talk about evolution or design, we're made this way. Because we only need to see the stuff that matters to us. Mm -hmm. 
if we could see that entire spectrum, I couldn't see you. Right. There's so much bombardment in front of me. It would be like a snowstorm. It'd be like watching the, the Matrix. Yeah. You couldn't see anything. So we have to have that filter to remove all that stuff. Right. Uh, or that program in the Matrix to remove all the rest of the superfluous uh, clutter. Garbage. Uh, so that I can navigate my world. And I, I'm telling you, man, I've, I've taken those deep metaphysical dives like that right. and just sit there and, and really think about it. And it's, it'll get you, it'll hurt your brain. You'll have a headache <laughs> afterwards. You're just like, ah, oh, man, that hurt. <laughs> but it's just like work, kind of work, like working out, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't want to work out, but I have to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, doing math or whatever you're working another part of your brain and it, and it is work so now i got a question for you regarding uh, I, I do believe there's real phenomena I, I have experienced many spiritual things and ghostly things in my life um but i become more and more interested in the, in the idea and i was just talking to a gentleman in the hallway about it who's also an investigator that stopped by but i've been becoming more and more fascinated and interested in the idea that Maybe at least a good portion or a, maybe, I don't know, a percentage. But I think that some of this stuff is created by the observers. And I'm not just meaning that they interpreted things wrong. Like, oh, you know, the, there's a ballast problem. All oh, the lights flickering are spirits. I don't mean like that. I mean that they are very genuinely creating almost in, a, in the, uh, maybe a Tulpa-esque fashion, creating energies and, and personalities that do become a part of their world. And what are your thoughts on things like that? Um, so because, I'll, I'll fall back on what we were just talking about, because my mind is creating this table and this drink, sure. which is very delicious, mm. um, I certainly can do that in my head. You talk to John Tenney, uh, and he will t talk very much about, are we creating all of this? Oh, right. And yeah. is it outside of our head or is it in our head? Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's in our head, is it any less relevant or less real than if it's outside of our head? Sure. <laughs> sit, in, <laughs> sit in the dark and contemplate that for a little while. Yeah. Um, you know, there's those, there's those thoughts that uh, you and you and all this is not real. I'm experiencing this through whatever other means yeah. just to entertain me, to keep me occupied. If I'm in the matrix and I'm in my little cocoon and I'm right, all right. used up, um, <laughs> you know, that, that's just the only way to keep me alive is I need challenges. So yeah. uh, when you're looking at the paranormal, you're looking at, uh, usually you're looking at a whole bunch of different people in silos, right? They're all in their own little silo. Sure. Since that's the, the, the word of the day now. <laughs> um, and we're all kind of isolated in these things and we specialize in things. And you look at, uh, let's say, Dr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, she's very much in her silo of uh, primatology. That's yeah. what her PhD is at. Yeah. I love her so much for having that broad spectrum of, I know this to be true. What else is going on? You know, she's, right. she's there and she's open. And you will meet scientists and biologists and, and mathematicians and cosmologists and everything that is just absolutely in their silo and they absolutely refuse to believe anything out right. outside of their silo. <clears throat> um, and that's one of those things when you're disciplinary in a per particular thing, mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard for you to look at those other things and you will inadvertently go into the same scenario of the shadow person in the corner of the room. And if you are a ufologist, that was an alien presence. If you are uh -huh. a demonologist, it was a demon. Mm -hmm. If you... <laughs> We're a ghost person. That's a shadow person. If you're, you know, it's just very much disciplinary on on what your specialty is, <clears throat> on, and <clears throat> your training experience is one thing, right? Uh, but also, there's a thing I I do a whole talk on what's called vapes. It's uh, your your values, mm -hmm. your assumptions, your behaviors, and your expectations. So those vapes are. Um, built off of your social contra constructs and your in your cultural constructs, and so my values as being raised Catholic, uh, I'm very polite. Uh, or I try to be a, I try to be obnoxious. <laughs> um, you know, I I I treat all, all, I 
tried to treat everybody with respect. Sure. And and that came from my, uh, you know, being an altar boy and all right. that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and all those things that come with that. Right. Uh, and uh, and so I, I have kind of those values and I like animals a lot. Mm -hmm. I value them as, as sometimes as highly as some humans. <laughs> um, and... And I think we should treat the the environment. I think this is our only planet. Going to Mars, sorry, Elon Musk, going to Mars is a bad, <laughs> stupid idea. Uh, there's no McDonald's there. It sucks. <laughs> um, dude, you don't have any trees there. You're, you're, oh, you're, we're going to go there. Cool. Get there and come back. And, yeah. And to think to stay there is not, not to me, is not. Anyway. Um, when you're looking at those those kind of values, that's kind of what I look at. Is we need to take care of what we have. Right? Yeah. Like if we want to go to Mars, good. I want to do that. I want to put money into it. And I, want, I want that to happen. But let's concentrate a little bit here. It's a huge uh, dis... And not disrespect, but it's, it's a huge disservice for religion to say, uh, this is hell on earth. Don't worry, you're going to go to a better place. So everybody just craps on what right. I have. And it's like, I'm not worried about it because I'm going to a better place. It's just stupid. Right. Sure. Um, so, and then your assumptions. I'm assuming that you're going to treat me the way I ex uh, I would treat you. Yeah. Or I'm, uh, I'm assuming that this is the way things are and that's how I'm going to interact with it. And then I base my behaviors off of that uh, and then my expectations of whenever I go someplace or meet people or whatever, the expectation thing is the biggest uh, danger. Right. right. Um, when you, I, I tell the people I work with, I, I work with a whole big group of team, team of people. And one of the biggest challenges for me is quit expecting perfection from human beings. Right. You are going to be a miserable old bastard uh, yeah. and just nervous and pissed off and staying up all night long, staring at the CEO fan mad yeah. Um, get over it. They're going to do the best they can and provide a course correction for them if they'll take it. No, no. Uh, otherwise, do the best you can. Yeah. And in those those expectations, mm -hmm. I can give you an example. I I was uh, I did martial arts for a long time, and I I went to um, Lantu Island. It's over. It's it's a little island off of Hong Kong in China. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a uh, monastery there. And I wanted to go visit the monastery and hang out with the monks and, and, and do stuff. So I was there for a few days. Uh, and But while I was there, I really wanted to go to a, a place called Fan Lao Fort. It was supposed to be this this haunted fort. Uh, and it was an old soldier's fort from the uh, uh, 1500s to 1700s. They had been there watching pirates. Pirates would come in and out of this area, and they would watch and, and do whatever they were doing. Mm -hmm. Well, over that span of time... Some of those soldiers died, and there would have been a graveyard there, and there was some talk, a little bit of violence in there, and not a lot, but it was just really fascinated by this place and drawn to it. Yeah. A lot of the times when I investigate, they're like, hey, you want to go to this really haunted location or this haunted location? I'm like, no, I want to go to this little farmhouse over here that I heard that, you know, it's just this yeah, right. little obscure place. Yeah, right. Uh, I think it, maybe everything else has got the energy sucked out of it, or like what you were talking about, so many people have been there, they've put energy into it. Uh, yeah. So I'm just kind of looking, you know. Anyway, so uh, I, I get this taxi cab, and he could barely speak English, and we'll, but we communicated, and he takes me, and I thought that I was going to, like, a, a, a visitor center or something. We're going to go look at Fail Out Fort. No, it's just an abandoned fort in the woods. Long. Um, well, oddly enough, I don't know if y'all have seen the, uh, uh, you know, like in China, they build these big cities and nobody lives in them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One's right by Fan Lao Fort. It's not a city. It is a uh, <coughs> shopping center and a big giant uh, apartment complex that has never been lived in. And that was in the <coughs> 90s when I was there. I was in there in like 94. Um, but it was really weird. There's this big structure. Nobody's living there. It's this huge oh. thing. Um, and anyway, so the guy's like, yeah, down that way. I'm like, what? You know? So he gets out of the car and we walk through this woods and then there's the foundation of the fort and job. So I was like, all right. And, uh, I was like, all right, we, you know, I'll, I'll call it for another cab. He goes, there's no other cab's going to come out. <laughs> so he just stayed there. I right. Mean, he just stayed there. He stayed up in the car and I spent about four hours messing around down there. Um, and, but w when we went through the, the woods, he, Showed me the fort. He goes back up, and I, I'm getting out my gear. I just had, you know, just some camera equipment and some stuff. And this little bird comes and is 
jumps down like at my feet and he's jumping around you know ch- chirping i like saying beeping he sounded like he was beeping <laughs> chirping and beeping and just jumping around <clears throat> and i'm like wow that's a really cool bird you know and <clears throat> what, what's he doing you know he's jumping around in chicago in his nest or something i'm from texas we have these things called kildees this little bird that runs back and forth and and when you get close to their young, yeah, they yeah. kick their, their wing out. Act like they're wounded. Yeah. yeah, and they try to get you away from me. I thought that's what this bird was doing, yeah. right? So I'm looking for the ghost. I'm looking for the the, the cemetery there. Uh, and I spend all my time doing that. And this bird is just jacking around with me the whole time while I'm there. Like he'd fly up in the wood, in the, in the trees, and I'd walk, and then he'd fly down, and he'd jump around, and then he'd jump around. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, after a while, I was like, yeah, all right, dude. Yeah, I see. All right, I'm not doing anything. I'm just looking around. Uh, and I do my thing. I'm gonna go back up, and, and and prior to that, actually, the the little the guy in the taxi cab, we had stopped off. I wanted to get some something to eat for like a lunch out there, and this lady had given me this little prayer thing. Uh, it's like this little Buddhist prayer thing. It had some beans, some lentils, some rice, and right. whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so, as I was leaving, I was thinking there and doing the little thing, and the 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 guy that the driver comes down and he's no 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 and i was doing it wrong you know so he did it for me and then we oh. sat there and did the little meditation we, we took off nice and you know nothing happened it was a, it was really cool it was it was a good time a couple of years later i find out the the earth mother uh in 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 chinese lore there at land land to island the earth mother sends you a blue bird for oh. with a message um i completely missed the message Oh wow. oh wow! Because my expectations were, I was looking for the guns. You were, yeah, you were Americanized. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think what you said is absolutely true. I think it's it's such a um, a distraction when we do our Googler research <laughs> uh, and they print up our little thing up the legend of wherever it is, and we go there to look for that. I couldn't agree more. I, I, it's been a pet peeve of mine forever. And I, I watch as many of the investigation shows as I can. And some of them seem to do better jobs than others, whatever. I mean, I'm an outsider looking in. But one of the things that always has driven me nuts, and everybody does it, is they'll get the history and they'll go around this place. Well, Colonel Stevens, are you here? And they go the whole place looking for Colonel Stevens. Well, there might be, you know, Ed, Phil, and, and Becky. But, well, he's not talking to us. You no. Know? Uh, when you go in with those expectations, like, how do you know what's there? Just because something happened doesn't mean that's what you're going to find. So they go in with the assumptions. It's, it's always driven me nuts because I think that why would, if a spirit is intelligent, why is it going to engage with you? If, if I started calling you, you know, Bob, hey, hey how's it going, Bob? I'm not Bob. You know, and I think that's that's uh, the case. You're, that's a, a brilliant analysis. Yeah, yeah. Don't. Amazing, I don't know how we're doing on time here. Sorry, yeah, we're about. I don't know. Oh my God, this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on, man. <laughs> I I just want you to take take a few minutes to let people know how to stay in touch with what you're doing because it's brilliant work. Your 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 books are brilliant. To the, well, thank you. Yeah, I'd like you to spread the news to our listeners how to get a hold of it. All right, um, I can be found at greglawson.org because I am an organization. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, theparanormaldetective.com. I'm on a podcast with uh, um, Dave Schrader at the Paranormal 60. I only do the news. Oh, okay. And we drink while we're doing it. <laughs> The paranormal sixty turns into the paranormal one forty five, and it's just <laughs> unintelligible at the end. Of that. Um, and yeah, so I and, and and my stuff's on Amazon. So you go. perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for making the time for us today. I'm absolutely honored. It's been a pleasure to finally meet you, but also just to you know, pick your brain a little bit. Thanks. Well, thanks, man. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you guys for asking me. On. All right, brother. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap it up for us today. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show. And thank you again so much for all your love and support. And uh, remember, if you want to follow the Paranormal Portal, probably the easiest way is to head over to ParanormalPortal.net. And that's the homepage for the Paranormal Portal. And you'll find links to all of our different social media and uh, sites and information about the shows, including our YouTube channel, which is YouTube.com slash Paranormal Portal. Or just look for Paranormal Portal on on Google or whatever search engine and you'll find 
links to our social media such as Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and uh, Twitter. So we're kind of all over the place and uh, we're spreading as, as well as we can. But anyway, thank you so much for the love and support. Y'all take care and remember, we love y'all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other, help each other out. Find the magic in every day and remember to laugh as much as you can. Until next time.